Please. It's an initiative of the municipality of Jerusalem, but obviously it has implications for the entire state and our foreign policy. What I want to make clear is that it's completely misunderstood. Israel is not planning, nobody in Israel, not the municipality or anybody else, was planning to tax churches. What if you have a situation where across from the King David Hotel, or across from the hotel, from the hotel, other hotels of Jerusalem, those hotels, like the King David, are paying municipal taxes. But a hotel owned by a religious entity like a church is free from paying taxes. This is what the municipality questioned. But in terms of taxing the land of churches and synagogues, never in the cards. Only appears in distorted reports coming from highly prejudiced reporters. How does privilege to be, I'm Dan Pollock from the Science of Recognition of America, how does privilege to be obscuring uh, just before the recognition of Jerusalem that you testified that? And I believe you predicted correctly that people were overestimating the so-called Arab Street reaction. Now that we've had the event of American recognition <coughs> And the reaction has not been extreme. Do you have any analysis of what really goes on and how the Arab world, and particularly the rank and file of the Arab world, has reacted to the reality that Jerusalem is a lost capital? Look, I'll just say one thing. It is extremely important for us to establish the truth of what's going on there the record of what's going on there. Sheikh Raid Salah, the head of the northern branch of the Islamic movement, essentially the head of the Muslim Brotherhood in Israel, puts forward these lies. Al-Aqsa is in danger. And many believing Muslims get very concerned, get very riled up. It has implications not just for Israel, but for neighboring countries. Go to Jordan, ask them. Now this is a total lie, as I said many times, that we're undermining the foundations of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. We have to get our message across what is the truth of what's going on in Jerusalem. We want religious liberty. We want Muslims to pray there. You know, I'll share with you a story. I was well connected with a Saudi think tank and the head of the Saudi think tank is a religious Muslim. He came to Jerusalem and he led the afternoon prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And my reaction to that was great. That's what Jerusalem's all about. That's what should be happening. But this lie that we undermine the foundations of the Al-Aqsa Mosque when the workers doing that all belong to Sheikh Raid Salah, that we have to oppose and expose. In the back. I'm not sure I understand your first question. Well, that's what the president said, yes.
So let's start with the first. And again, the question was, look, I'm not going to get into how the United States organizes its bureaucracy for foreign policy. But I will say this. The man who decides the foreign policy of the United States of America is the President of the United States. And he's my guideline as to what American policy is. It may take a while for some people to catch up, but that's how I regard American foreign policy, guided by the Commander-in-Chief of the United States. Now, Turkey, we've had some tense relations. I was involved in negotiations for the normalization of our relations. And it is my hope, and that's all I can say right now, that we'll put that relationship on a new footing in the future. It's my hope. But it's very important for us to go to Ankara, to go to Istanbul, and to explain how there are people in the Arab world trying to mislead them. And bring proof. Don't just say it. It's not rhetoric. And I think Israel and Turkey ultimately have um, a basis. We have similar interests in the Middle East. And the rise of the Iranian mini superpower is as much a concern for them as it is for us. So we'll find a way of creating that, that relationship. And I hope eventually you'll see something about that. I can tell you one thing about Saudi Arabia. When I wrote that book, Hatred's Kingdom, right after 9-11, our intelligence was estimating that between 50 and 70 percent of the Hamas budget was provided by Saudi Arabia. Today, if you asked me how much of the Hamas budget comes from Saudi Arabia, my estimate would be zero. So back in 2003, 2004, we were in the Second Intifada. We had Hamas buses, or Israeli buses with Hamas members, blowing up in the heart of Jerusalem, the heart of Tel Aviv, the heart of Ashkelon. And so anybody who was helping the Hamas movement in that effort was obviously threatening the state of Israel. And that's why I wrote the book. But today, we're in a new reality. And hopefully, we can make, at some point, aspects of our relationship more open. But it's clear today that there is one central threat in the Middle East. And that threat is hovering over all these countries. And that is the new imperial role that the Islamic Republic of Iran sees for itself. And uh, that threat is being carried out on the ground by General Qasem Soleimani, commander of the uh, Quds Force of the Revolutionary Guards in a half a dozen countries. That's what has to be stopped. And hopefully, with our relations with the United States and with Arab countries, we can be a part of blocking that spread of hostile Iranian influence. Okay. You can't force things down people's throats. But you certainly can insist 
that textbooks that incite the population of the Palestinians not be part of what UNRWA, which takes care of Palestinian refugees, um, advances. So I think the way to do something is to look at what UNRWA is up to, look at those textbooks, and get them changed. And remember, we used to talk about peacemaking all the time. What are the elements of peacemaking? Borders, refugees. The most important thing is getting a different mindset in the, among the Palestinians. And I think that is beginning to happen, but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of time. Okay. Thank you for coming.